when. Let's bow together for prayer as we get started this evening. Father, we pause to invoke your blessing upon our study together. Help us to be able to push aside the cares of the day and things in which we've been involved and to be able to maintain our focus upon your word and upon that which you have for us this evening. We thank you for each man that's present in the group this evening and for this opportunity. We thank you for your word and for the marvelous grace message that's in it for both inspiration and instruction that we find through it. And so we pray for wisdom that we might be able to understand the application of it to our lives and continue to give you honor and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have been studying the subject of the old sin nature in trying to get a better understanding of why we do what we do and uh, how we can best uh, handle the problem of our natural disposition. We've seen in our study that Adam was created body, soul, and spirit, but the day he ate of the forbidden fruit, he died spiritually. And re as a result of that, eventually died physically as well. But each of us are born not as he was created with body, soul, and spirit, but we're born with body and soul. Thus, Jesus said to Nicodemus, she must be born again, born from above, literally is how he says it. Recognizing that we need a spiritual birth because of the sin of Adam, not only did we inherit his nature, which has a natural disposition to sin, but we have the imputed sin as well, and so we must be born again. We've been looking at that subject of our behavior, and we looked at Romans chapter 7 to begin with, uh, all about verses 14 through 35, in which Paul explains uh, the reason why we do what we do. And uh, when the good, the, the good that we would, we don't do, and the evil that we hate, that's the thing that we practice, he said. And so he goes on to explain that as a result of our having an old sin nature, a natural tendency to sin. And so as we have looked at that statement, uh, as it's documented for us in Scripture, we saw that he also gave us the solution to it when he cried out in his despair, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He answered his question by saying, I thank God it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So through Jesus Christ, we can have victory over that old nature. We look then at chapter six, seven, and eight of the book of Romans to get a better understanding of the concept of that. And, um, uh, also, in that process, we identified the anatomy, the makeup of the old nature, having an area of strength that produces human good. Isaiah 64, 6, however, says that our righteousnesses are filthy rags before him. Have an area of weakness that produces overt sin. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 identifies, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Each one of us have a besetting sin, and yet we can have victory over that and have uh, the blessings of God and the peace that passes understanding in our life if we learn how to deal with the old nature. We also discovered in our study in the anatomy and makeup of the old nature that we have a trend either toward our area of strength or toward our area of weakness, either toward do goodism or toward overt sin. And then we discovered that there is a lust pattern in our old nature. There are three primary areas of lust the Bible identifies, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And in that identification, we recognize that one of those there is a 
definite pattern in our life, whether it be the ego problem or materialism problem, or whether it be a sensuality problem. The lust of the flesh is, is the uh, obsession with satisfying the senses. The lust of the eyes is the garnering of material things. Uh, and uh, the pride of life is ego. And so we have looked through the basic makeup of the old nature. And hopefully by now you have identified your area of strength, your area of weakness. Uh, you are familiar with your own trend and your lust pattern. And you're ahead of the game in that you're beginning to deal with that before it becomes sin rather than after it becomes sin. Now, we've examined also the source of the mechanics of temptation, well, the source and the mechanics of temptation, noting that God is not the source of temptation, but rather a man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust relative to his lust pattern and enticed, enticed by the bait that has been set up by Satan and his minions. In our study of that, we saw the need then to change our behavior by changing the way we think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, the scripture declares. And we have seen that the word heart, cardios, uh, refers to the functioning mind where our norms and standards, our conscience, our frame of reference is. And so if we're going to behave different, we've got to think different. And... Paul told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that we need to tear down the old strongholds. We identified those strongholds as forts to which we go in a time of frustration or anxiety or worry or concern, places that we go for refuge. And there are a variety of them, uh, quite, a, quite a number of different avenues that humanity pursues in trying to uh, escape reality and to deal with the issues, but what we have to do is tear those down. They are made out of human logic and reasoning, and we have to replace them with a new stronghold or a new fort, and we identified that as understanding and responding to making proper application of the basic principles of grace. So we called it Fort Grace as the place to which we need to go and to establish ourselves firmly in the word of God uh, and in the knowledge of the grace provision that God has given so that we are able to have victory day by day in our walk, not only over our old sin nation, but over our uh, old sin nature, but over our circumstances and the other aspects that we are confronted with day by day. Last week, we introduced David's understanding as he had built in to his cardios, to his heart, uh, a place of refuge, uh, understanding the concepts of grace and making application to them. And uh, we saw that he adopted a battle cry that really identifies what we need to do if, uh, and to understand if we're going to have peace that passes understanding. And if we're going to have victory over the old man or the old nature, we need to understand the battle is the Lord's. And so we were looking at the text uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, where David uh, makes reference, uh, or, or the record is of his not only making reference to, making application of that principle, as he went out to fight Goliath. Uh, you remember the story, no doubt. It's a story that we have told many, many times and is heard in a lot of segments of life, how that David, uh, the younger of uh, his, uh, younger than his brothers, uh, had the responsibility of caring for the sheep. His brothers had gone off to war uh, with King Saul, uh, David had a familiarity with King Saul, you may remember, in that they had uh, uh, frequently taken David to play his heart for King Saul. Uh, King Saul, the 
God had removed uh, his Holy Spirit from Saul uh, because of Saul's disobedience, and there was an evil spirit that troubled Saul. Uh, when David would come and play his harp, the evil spirit left, and Saul was soothed. But now Saul was facing a battle with the Philistines, and they were encamped on one mountain, while the Philistines were encamped on another mountain, and there was a valley between them. And for 40 days, the giant Goliath had come out and challenged them to send a man to fight him, that if he prevailed over that man that the Israelites sent, then the Israelites would be subject to the Philistines. But if that man they sent was victorious over Goliath, then the Philistines would be servient to the Israelites. Well, nobody in the camp of Israel wanted to go fight uh, this giant. And uh, so he had taunted them for 40 days. He had taunted them uh, about sending someone. And when David arrived in camp to take a, a care package to his brothers and uh, uh, check on how the war was going and how well they were faring, his dad, Jesse, had sent him to check on those things. When he heard the cry of the giant and the challenge, he wanted to know why nobody had gone out to fight. And uh, when Saul discovered then that uh, David had been inquiring about that, uh, then Saul sent for David, and David said, I'll go fight the giant. And uh, uh, apparently, as we said last time, King Saul must have been pretty desperate to allow a shepherd boy uh, to go out and represent all of Israel when Saul himself was, was stood uh, head and shoulders above any man in Israel, and the nearest to uh, having any kind of size compared to that of Goliath. We're not really told about the size of uh, David, but simply that he was a youth. David said, uh, well, it's not a problem for me to go out and fight him because it won't be me fighting him. The battle is the Lord's. And as we understand that and adopt that, we'll be able then to begin to have victory over our old nature, as well as developing peace uh, in the midst of conflict and circumstances uh, that are beyond our control and that we don't have uh, any uh, assets that we're aware of to take care of, we just need to remember that the battle is the Lord's. And so we, we left after David uh, had been given Saul's armor. Saul put his own armor on David, and David laid it aside, saying that he hadn't tested that. And of course, it certainly didn't fit uh, the shepherd uh, David. And so David said, me, take what I have tried and what I am familiar with. And he took his sling and his pouch. And remember, he stopped down at the brook and he picked up five smooth stones and put in his shepherd's bag. Uh, and uh, we, with his sling then, he went out to meet the, the, the giant. Well, it's at verse 41 then, uh, and that should be on your wall there, uh, that we pick up with our notes, it says, and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. So not only do we have a giant of a man uh, that is coming to fight, but he has a, a uh, man that is actually carrying the shield uh, to, gu to guard him and to protect him. Uh, he has a shield bearer that's going on before him. David is going without a shield bearer. Well, maybe not, because David says the battle is the Lord's. And so apparently uh, he understood he would later, later write a psalm, the Lord is my shield and my buckler. So David understood that concept even now. He would later put it to, 
to paper uh, and it would become part of the word of God as a testimony to us that the Lord truly is our shield and our buckler. So David goes out to meet him. Well, verse 42 says, when the Philistine looked about and he saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair complex, a fair, fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David unto the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. Paul told us, remember back in 1 Corinthians 10, that the weapons of our war warfare are not carnal, but they are spiritual. David says, by the way, he doesn't mention his sling. What he does say is, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. David recognizes, as would Saul years later, that the weapons of our warfare are not of a fleshly nature, but rather they are spiritual. David continued as he spoke to Goliath, and he said, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You remember David's concern was that here was this Philistine blaspheming God and not a person in Israel was willing to be the servant of God and to allow uh, the, the reputation of God to be tarnished was something David couldn't endure. So he makes that speech to the Philistine, Goliath, as he goes out to meet him. This day, the Lord will deliver thee into mine hand. I will smite thee. I will take thine head from thee. I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast and to the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I find it interesting, <coughs> excuse me, that he doesn't just leave uh, or make the statement about taking the head off of Goliath, but he's not intending to stop there. He says, I will deliver or I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day under the bowels of the air. So it's not, a, not going to be a surrender on the part of the Philistines. Uh, to serve the Israelites, uh, uh, and we'll see. We, you see in the story as you read it on through uh, that they flee uh, when when Goliath is defeated. But David already has in mind that uh, the giant's not the only place that they're going to stop that day. But the carcasses of the host of the Philistines will become fodder for the wild beast of the earth that everyone may know there is a God in Israel. He goes on in verse 47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So David reaches out to the congregation of Israel itself uh, that through his action, the whole assembly is going to know that the Lord saveth not with sword or with spear because it's the Lord's battle. It is a spiritual battle, and the Lord will give you into our 
hand. So he incorporates uh, the others uh, uh, in the army along with him in this assured victory that uh, he is so positive about. Look at verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Well, it would seem that David certainly understands what he has stated in his declaration of war, that the battle is the Lord's, and he certainly has confidence that the Lord's going to deliver not only Goliath, but the entire army into their hands, uh, that it's not going to be with swords or with, with spears, but it is going to be with the might and the power of God. And uh, so David runs to meet the giant. There is no drip, drip, drip of circumstances with David. There is no caution uh, nor any hesitation, but rather it is with an eagerness that he runs into the fray. Then we're told in verse 49, and David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. He had five in his six shooter, but he only used one shot uh, as he slung that stone. We find that it sunk into the forehead of Goliath. Uh, the, the conception of the uh, armor in that day uh, by the Philistines would show that many of them wore a face mask uh, of steel, uh, but the forehead apparently was exposed, and uh, the, the stone found its mark. No, probably was guided by the hand of God and struck the Philistine in the forehead and sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Verse 50 then says, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Now David had already boasted that he was going to give, uh, uh, to, to take the head from the body of Goliath. Uh, and he has no sword in his hand. Well, all of the mockery and all of the fierceness of the enemy had no effect upon the confidence and faith of David. David had a knowledge of God in his right frontal lobe that was built upon a relationship with God. And so there was confidence. Uh, and when he uh, heard the challenge of the giant, it simply spurred him on to uh, do that which God had given him to do. He understood that the faith of the whole army of Israel would rally if they could see the giant fall dead. Isn't it interesting how the others then began to rally and take pursuit of the Philistines once they saw victory had been, had been achieved by the shepherd boy over the giant Goliath that had been challenging them for 40 days. The Lord saveth not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, was the cry of David, and it became the cry then of the army of Israel. We, we would emphasize again that God is a saving God. That word saveth means to save or to help or to come to the aid of, it's to be contrasted with the Hebrew word for deliver that is found back in verse 35 and verse 37, uh, which was not Saul, uh, as well as with the word for deliver that's found in verse 46, which is the Hebrew word salgar, which means to close up or abandon to. Now, the action that's emphasized by the verb that we have here is progressive. 
So the, the meaning is God's help is never uh, in any of uh, um, his saving acts, merely a sword or a spear. God's help to man is always supernatural, beyond human possibility. So David's faithful expectation of God's help in this situation is certainly evidenced here. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Um, the Bible says, if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Uh, there was a, an agreement that the, the prevailing man, uh, that the other army would be subservient to his army. But that agreement didn't last long when they saw Goliath fall down dead. And, uh, and they fled. Verse 52 says, the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they came to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sherem, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. So the men of Israel and of Judah, seeing the success that David had with Goliath, were encouraged and took faith and pursued then the army of the Philistines, leaving them wounded down uh, across the valley and to the gates uh, of Gath itself. We're told then in verse 53 that the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. So they were victorious over the Philistines and uh, had been saved from what looked like certain destruction uh, on their part. And now they go in and plunder the camp of the Philistines. Verse 54 says, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Now, we said that, that he didn't have a sword. I need to go back uh, to verse 51, uh, and, and I missed that. So David ran and stood upon the Philistine, and he took his sword, and he drew it out of the sheath thereof, and he slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So he beheaded the giant just as he said he would, didn't have any equipment on his own to do it, but there was the sword provided. And noticed uh, Goliath had never got his sword out of the sheath. It, it was still in the sheath. And uh, David took the sword, drew it out of the sheath, and cut the head off of uh, Goliath. And so we are told in verse 54 that David took the head of the Philistine and he brought it to Jerusalem but he put Goliath's armor in his tent. In verse 55 then, and when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this you? And Abner said, as thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, inquire thou whose stripling this, whose son the stripling is. Not very respectful, David calling him a stripling here. Uh, the Hebrew word uh, is a limb, and it means something that's been kept out of sight. Uh, there, it, it seems strange to me as I read this. Uh, David played the harp for Saul on occasion, remember, when Saul was despondent and, and in depression and was troubled by uh, the evil spirit, uh, we find that David would play the harp. And, and there was an occasion that he did that for a while, and then he went back to his father. Saul does not recognize the harp player. He wants to know who this young man is. And uh, uh, he, he fails to recognize him. He indicates by his question 
that this miracle worker is, is something that must have been kept hidden before him and from others. But now when the chips are down, he is here and uh, has become quite visible. Uh, we need to be encouraged by that, that God always has his resources. And when we have no resources, we have no way of taking care of our obligations, uh, our circumstance, our situation is something that we do not see how possibly we can get through it. The encouragement is that God has resources we don't know about. And of course, I'm always quick to say, yeah, he's got the resources, but he got me on a limited budget as to what comes my way. But he will provide for our needs and help us with our circumstances. And I, I preach that as much to me as I do to you in the particular circumstances that we, my wife and I are facing this week with some obligations and, and seeming no way to, to take care but God is faithful, and the battle is the Lord's. We are to seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to us. We don't see it until it's necessary for it to be there. They had not understood the power of their God and the resources of their God until David declared the battle is the Lord's and went out to defeat Goliath. We're told then in verse 57, and as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son art thou, young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So there were brothers of David. There were other sons of Jesse the Bethlehemite uh, that were there in the army, uh, and David himself had played for the king, uh, but he does not make that connection, and I find it kind of interesting. The scripture doesn't make any connection about uh, the, the absurdity, uh, seeming absurdity of that as well. David understood grace, he had assembled Fort Grace in his own mind, heart. The towers of God's provision were understood, and they were applied in this instance. The banner over the towers read, the battle is the Lord's. At least that was the thinking of David. Later on, David would apply the grace principle to King Saul as God's anointed uh, even when in his jealousy, Saul would try to kill him. All we have to, to get the whole story, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, uh, to, to understand the grace concept of David. Because uh, there would come a time when Samuel, the, the prophet, judge prophet, moved from one position to the other, when Samuel would anoint Jesus, uh, excuse me, David, as uh, the next king, God identifying that he was replacing Saul because of Saul's disobedience. The jealousy of Saul caused Saul on numerous occasions to attempt to kill David. But David understood that Saul was still God's anointed. And though he had taken his spirit from him, he had not yet removed him out of his office and put David in that office. And so he would manifest a grace attitude toward Saul on a number of occasions. You may remember when Saul was pursuing David and David and his men had gone into a cave to hide. Uh, the king, King Saul, didn't know they were in there, but he went in the cave to relieve himself. <laughs> and while he was relieving himself, David cut off a piece of his, of his robe and waited till he had gone back out of the cave and got off on another point. And David went out and waved that to him. You want, want to check your coattail. <laughs> I have a piece of it here. You were in my, 
uh, in range of my dagger. Uh, I didn't do anything to you. I simply uh, cut off a piece of your garment. Uh, that didn't dissuade, of course, Saul at all. And uh, uh, there, there were other times that uh, Saul attempted to kill David. But David treated him in grace, understanding that he was the anointed of the Lord. And uh, at the appointed time, at the appropriate time, David would be in the position that God had indicated already he was going to put him in at the appointed hour and the appointed time. So time with God is much different than time with us. The battlefield uh, is different from uh, God's approach than from our approach. And we simply need to understand that and try to, to master the doctrine of grace in that we might be able then through our understanding of the concept of grace to know the resources that are available to us so that we can have victory over the old sin nature and we can have joy, we can have peace in the midst of, of conflict and in the midst of a battle, we can still have peace if we come to understand the battle truly is the Lord's and we apply that to our lives and to our situation. Now, we have looked at these concepts of the old sin nature and dealing with the old nature, and we have identified uh, uh, the resources, some of those resources that are available to us as we go out to battle uh, and, and day by day uh, in face temptation, uh, baited snares that are set there for us. And uh, so I want to look now uh, at the document that we sent today uh, at the means for dealing with sin in our life as a result of our having the old sin nature. We have said that we are to confess our sin, that 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the primary text in the New Testament. We've also identified that in the Old Testament, under the Levitical system, there were five daily offerings, and two of those dealt with our daily walk, our fellowship with God on the part of the Old Testament believer. And uh, uh, three of those dealt with their salvation, the burnt offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering identified to them the salvation that was going to be possible through the Messiah when God would become flesh and dwell among us. He also identified the trespass offering and the sin offering that they were to observe every day to remind them of the provision that was made so that we can have fellowship with God as well as salvation through him, that we can uh, have the power of God operating in our life uh, on a routine and daily basis. And so we we had the ritual of the trespass offering for sins that were knowingly committed and the sin offering for sins that were committed in ignorance. They're both sin and they needed to be dealt with. And we have sins that we're aware of in our life. And for that, we confess those sins as per 1 John 1, 9. But there are other sins in our life that we're not aware of that we commit in ignorance. And yet they are sin and they need to be dealt with. And so when we confess our known sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, there's an illustration of this process for us that I like to refer to over in the Gospel of John. And uh, so we, we titled the study, the necessity of foot washing. Now, there was a question asked in one of our earlier 
uh, classes uh, a while back about foot washing, uh, and I touched on this, but I want us to look at it this evening. Uh, in I've titled it The Necessity of Foot Washing the Old Sin Nature in Dealing with Sin Through the Doctrine of Confession. In the ancient world, because uh, very few of the streets had any kind of pavement uh, at all, uh, and because the people went barefoot or wore open sandals, it was customary when uh, the, a guest would arrive in your home for you to provide water with which he could wash his feet. Now, those hosts that were wealthy or had servants would have their servant wash the feet of their guests. On some occasions, if it was a very honored guest, the host himself might perform that task of washing the feet of his guests. It was a primary a servant role and responsibility. Well, at the Last Supper, Jesus laid aside his garments, he girded himself with a towel, and he began to wash the feet of his disciples. You remember when he got to Simon Peter, Simon Peter asked him, do you intend to wash my feet? And Jesus said, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. So Peter said, thou shalt never wash my feet. I like to read this in the Greeks, the Greek text. He uses the subjunctive. He says, there is no potential at all for you to ever wash my feet. So Jesus said to Peter, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. But when Peter heard that, he said, Lord, don't stop with my feet then, not, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. Now, this account that's found in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John teaches us the necessity of washing our feet. Now, the central truth that Jesus was teaching here through the actions that he performed was the need of being willing to serve one another, to have a, an attitude of servitude to others. And most of the time when we read the passage or we hear it expounded upon, that's the focus, that if he as Lord and Master had washed their feet, then we ought to wash one another's feet. Uh, but there is a deeper lesson that is found here, a very important lesson, uh, both along with our humility and willingness to serve others, uh, is to understand the other truth that is laying in this text that becomes very clear in the original language, but doesn't really jump out at us uh, in the English text. Jesus was the sovereign King of kings, Lord of lords, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He, he had absolute righteousness. He became subject to temptation, and was dependent upon the Holy Spirit uh, to live the life that he had been appointed to live by the Father. He was eternal, but he became subject to death. He was omniscient, but he came subject to learning. He was omnipresent, but he came tied to a body, to time and space. He who was loved became the, the subject of uh, to like passions as we are. And so he was God, but God became a servant to mankind. And now in that servant role, he actually begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Now, the more theological aspect of this text is that God is initiating something here that he instructs them to do. Now, some have taken this as a command 
for the church to have an ordinance of foot washing. And they have understood Jesus' statement. If I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. And so there are Christians that take that literal and uh, uh, do so by establishing an ordinance of the church that when they have uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, they have a foot washing ceremony ahead of it. Now, in my study of Scripture, uh, I have found no uh, evidence that this was to be a command that the church was to practice. Uh, and in the study of early uh, church history, there is no, um, no system in which it was practiced. Uh, there is no record of their understanding that at all. And so I don't believe uh, personally that he established an ordinance of foot washing. But I believe he taught us a very important theological concept and that it's necessary for us to understand that so that we can relate to it specifically. Now, in John chapter 13, the text begins in verse 2. And uh, follow me as I read verses 2 through verse 5. Supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, he riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. I um, mentioned this in one of our early studies a little bit about uh, our uh, having every year at Channel Islands Bible College and Seminary, we did what we called Reflections of Passover. Uh, at Passover time. And uh, we didn't uh, try to do the Passover because that would be to crucify Christ afresh and put him to an open shame based upon Hebrews. But what we did was to explain uh, what they did on Passover and along with the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, uh, and talk about the, the elements of it and how what the significance was and how that was fulfilled in the person and the work and the character of Jesus Christ himself. And uh, uh, one, one night as we were doing this, uh, I had prepared uh, on the table a, a pitcher of water and a basin and had a chair sitting there and uh, a towel over it. And uh, I said uh, that night as... Uh, uh, they had finished supper. Jesus laid aside his outer garment, and I laid aside my outer garment. And uh, he girded himself with a towel, and I girded myself with a towel. And I poured water into the basin, and I said, uh, Scripture says he began to wash the feet of the disciples. Well, it, was, uh, it would have been a thing to have seen on film the feet of each one of those students sitting at their tables, about, uh, oh, probably 140 or 150 people uh, in that fellowship. Uh, simultaneously, their feet went back under their chairs <laughs> in fear that I was going to start washing their feet. Well, I assured them that wasn't the case, that I had already prearranged with one of uh, uh, the people present that I would wash her feet, and the one I prearranged with was my wife, and so she had an alert to that uh, before we actually began the process, but then uh, I illustrated that by washing her feet. Now, the, the instruction that he gives about the attitude of being servant to all, uh, remember, is key but in the midst of that, in the dialogue that is recorded, we find a very important uh, 
doctrine that relates to what we're talking about here through the confession of sin and uh, uh, thus emphasizing the necessity for foot washing. When we read verses two through five, we notice the word wash in there. Supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing the Father had given him all things into his hand, that he was come from God, he arrived it from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. The word wash there in verse 5 is translated from the Greek word niptein. Niptein is an infinitive, which is a part of speech that denotes uh, the, the idea uh, of uh, purpose. Uh, and uh, it was Christ's purpose, we're being told in the text, to wash the feet of the disciples. So the word wash in verse 5 is niptein, and it is an infinitive identifying the purpose that Christ had was, was to wash the feet of the disciples. Now look at verse 6. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? The word wash here is niptis, not niptein as we had before. Nip teeps. And it's in the indicative mood that expresses reality. And Peter was saying, Lord, do you really intend to wash my feet? Now look at verse 7. Jesus answered and told and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Now look at Peter's reply in verse 8. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Now the word wash this time is nipsis. It's in the subjunctive mood, which is the mood of potentiality. It has the negative with it. The word never is translated from the Greek phrase, which means not even unto the end of the age. What he said to Jesus was, there is no potential for you to wash my feet, not even to the end of the age. Now look at verse, uh, the rest of verse 8, where Jesus answered. Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now Jesus used the subjunctive mood of potentiality, just as Peter had. Peter said, if you don't allow me to wash, or Jesus said, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, you will have no part with me. If there is no potential for me to wash your feet, Peter, you will have no part with me. Well, Peter responds in verse 9. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. In other words, Peter says, if that's the case, don't stop with my feet. Wash my hands and my head. Actually, wash all of me. Now look very carefully at verse 10. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. Now watch this. The word washed in verse 10 is translated from the Greek word Leluminos. It means to have a complete cleansing, to have a complete bath. Jesus said, the one who has had a complete bath or cleansing doesn't need a complete bath again. He only needs his feet washed. Now, where was that passage when I was a kid? And my mother was so insistent upon my taking a bath. See, if I had had that passage, I could have said, no, mom, 
Jesus said, when you've had a complete bath, you don't ever need a complete bath again. Just need to wash your feet. Well, I didn't uh, latch on to the passage. And by the time I did latch on to the passage, I came to understand what it was saying and didn't tout it over my mother's requirement for me occasionally to take a bath. I always marveled at that because uh, uh, one place where we lived, I remember we didn't have a bathtub. We had uh, a, a galvanized tub that my mom would fill with water. And uh, being the reluctant one, I was always the third one. My brother and sister were ahead of me in the tub. And I got the, the third uh, use of the water. Uh, wasn't very smart on my part. But uh, uh, I would have been content to say, no, I just need to wash my feet. What's Jesus mean by this? He that has had a complete bath doesn't need a complete bath again. He only needs to wash his feet. Well, two different words that we're dealing with, with the word what. We had uh, nipteen, we had nip case, we had nip sace. All of those are from the same lexical form word. They are from the word nipto. And now we have a different word that is used here. It is leluminos. So the, the word wash, when uh, Jesus said to him, he that is washed, leluminos, that's had a complete bath, needs not save or accept to wash and that's nipsis again. Uh, and, and the difference in the two, leluminos means to have a complete bath, a complete cleansing, if you will. But nipto means to wash a portion of something. Now, Jesus told Peter, if I don't, you don't let me wash your feet, you will have no part with me. The word part is translated from the Greek word meros, and it means the allocated portion due a partner. Now, it refers to fellowship with its benefits and rewards. It has absolutely nothing to do with salvation. That's the complete cleansing that occurs at the moment we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's impo important then that we understand this distinction. Jesus is not telling Peter that unless Peter allows him to wash his feet, he will not be saved. That's not the issue. Jesus is telling Peter, if he doesn't wash Peter's feet, Peter will not receive the benefits of of partnering in fellowship with the Lord. Now, that's an important distinction that we need to understand and make. In the ancient world, not everybody had a bathtub or a number three wash tub. So they might go down to the public bath to bathe. But by the time they got home from the bath, their feet were dirty. So he didn't need to bathe completely again. He did need to wash his feet. When we receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior, we are saved and completely cleansed. As a matter of fact, the scripture that talks about that in the Greek grammar is in one of two different tenses. It is either in the perfect tense which means a completed action in past time and the result continues forever, or it is in the aorist, the, the uh, constitutive aorist, which means a point of time taken out of time, divorced from time, and perpetuated forever. The moment we call upon the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, that moment of time is taken out of time, divorced from time, and perpetuated forever. We are eternally children of God. Born of the Spirit of God, we are now children of God. 
the idea is conveyed in the complete cleansing that occurs. That moment of time is also recorded as the perfect tense, which is a completed action. We are saved by grace through faith. Are you saved? Are you saved is in a completed action, and the result of that action continues forever. So we are eternally cleansed of our sin, having it charged to Jesus Christ. But our walk gets our feet dirty, and there is a need for a necessity, if you will, for foot washing from time to time. Now, when we accept Christ as personal Savior and are saved and are completely cleansed, uh, that's separated then from our daily walk where we get our feet dirty. Uh, the feet are representative of our walk. In our walk, we sometimes fail to conduct ourselves in the manner that we should. We commit personal sin. Yes, it's charged to Christ, but it breaks our fellowship with the Father. Now, we recognize then that Paul sets forth in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, for that which works out from the inside of me, I understand not. For what I desire, that practice I not. But what I hate, that's what I perform. You remember when we went through that? Well, we constantly have a problem with sin. And we keep failing to measure up to God's standard. And that does not mean that we're lost and need to be saved again. Remember, that was a new birth. Jesus said to Peter, he that has been completely cleansed, cleansed does not need to be completely cleansed again, but he needs to wash his feet. So we don't need the complete cleansing again. In our previous study, we discovered that every passage of Scripture that deals with salvation in the New Testament, as we've said tonight, is either perfect tense, a completed action with continuing results, or heiress tense, a point of time, divorced from time, taken out of time, and perpetuated forever. We're eternally secure in our position in Jesus Christ. But once we have been washed completely, we don't need that again, but we do need habitually to wash our feet in order to maintain fellowship with God and to get our allotted portion as a partner with him. The word wash in verse 10, in the phrase save to wash his feet, is a repetitive eros. Again and again and again and again, he needs habitually to wash his feet. We need to wash our feet repeatedly. Now, it's in the middle voice. We don't have a middle voice in English grammar. The active voice, the subject performs the action. The passive voice, the subject is acted upon. The Greek has a middle voice. The middle voice is the subject participates in the action and is affected by the result. Oh, he didn't say we had to wash our feet by ourselves. Nor did he say that someone else is to wash our feet. He uses the middle voice, which says we are to participate in the washing of our feet. We participate in the action, not something done without our involvement, nor is it something that we have to do alone. But Christ participates with us. Our part of the participation is the confession of sin. Jesus's part of the participation is to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, according to 1 John 1, 9. The word wash used here in chapter 13, verse 10, is an infinitive. We said an infinitive denotes purpose. So we are to make it our purpose to habitually participate in the washing of our feet. Now, any Christian service that we perform while we are out of fellowship 
that is, have dirty feet, is identified in Scripture as wood, hay, or stubble, and is going to be burned at the judgment seat of Christ. But if the believer's feet are clean during the performance of Christian service, the production is identified as gold, silver, and precious stones, which are not destroyed by the fire, but are purified by the fire. Remember, fire in the Bible is a symbol of God's judgment. The judgment seat of Christ does not involve the judging of believers <clears throat> as individuals, but rather the evaluation of our production individually. It's, there's an important distinction. The judgment seat of Christ, the, ju the judgment is not of the individual, but the evaluation of their works. Rather than the evaluation of production, uh, that's what we're to focus on. It is an important distinction to make. So the believer will not be judged, but his work will be judged. And the believer is not in jeopardy, but his reward is in jeopardy. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, he had, by the way, he had identified the foundation as Jesus Christ. Paul has laid that foundation of salvation. He says, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he will receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he himself shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The distinction between wood, hay, stubble versus gold, silver, and precious stone is not one of the work that's done, but of the source of that work. If our service is presented while we have unconfessed sin in our life, it's wood, hay, or stubble. By performing the same act while in fellowship with God, it is gold, silver, and precious stone. From the energy of the flesh we work, or we allow the Holy Spirit to do that work within us. I'm currently in our Sunday morning series at the church where I serve. Uh, we're doing a series on gold, silver, precious stone versus wood, hay, and stubble. And we emphasize repeatedly in this series that it's not the work that we do, it's the circumstance or condition, spiritual condition we're in when we do the work. We might teach a Sunday school class while we're in fellowship. Gold, silver, and precious stone is a category. If we're out of fellowship and we teach that Sunday school class, it's wood, hay, and stubble. Oh, it might have a lasting effect upon those that we're teaching who may not know the condition that we are in, but as far as our rewards are concerned, they burn up. They are judged as by fire, and uh, fire being the judgment of God at the judgment seat of Christ. And so we may start out with a armload of service that we're taking, but when we get there, we may find that most of it burned up along the way. And when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we might just have a small handful left. We're talking about fellowship when we're talking about control of the old sin nature. The eternal security of the believer is established throughout the New Testament. Romans chapter 8 Verses 1 and 2 indicates that our position in Christ is from ever falling into condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now 
no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Now, John chapter 10, verse 28 tells us that uh, we are in Christ's hand and no man can pluck us out. Second Timothy 2, 11 through 13 says that even if a person stops believing in Christ, he is kept secure. Galatians 3, 26 and John 1, 12 identify the family relationship. We are born into the family of God, once a son, always a son. Remember again, every passage of scripture in the New Testament that speaks of salvation is either in a type of aorist tense that means a point of time, taken out of time, divorced from time, and perpetuated forever. It's unchangeable. Or it's found in the perfect tense, a completed action with a result continuing forever. Acts chapter 16, verse 1, verse 31 says, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. The word believe is in the aorist tense. It is a point of time taken out of time, divorced from time, and perpetuated forever. They said believe in a point of time. In the point of that belief, that point of time is taken out of time, divorced from time, and perpetuated forever, according to the Greek grammar. On the other hand, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. The word saved is in the perfect tense. Saved in a completed action with the result of that saving lasting forever. So once we've been saved and completely cleansed, we never need to be completely cleansed again. We are eternally secure. However, because we still retain our old sin nature, we do get out of fellowship. We walk contrary to God's design. We walk where we shouldn't walk. We get our feet dirty. We are out of fellowship, and thus we lose the benefits of our allotted portion of our partnership. Now, when he said, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you won't have any part with me. He didn't mean his eternal kingdom with him, but rather the benefits of fellowship and the rewards that would go. If we commit that act, when we're out of fellowship, if we provide that Christian service out of fellowship, then there is no reward for us. But if we're operating under the sphere of the Spirit and the control of the Spirit of God, and we do that, then there is reward laid up for us. When we're out of fellowship, we lose that. We lose the benefits of our allotted portion as partners with Christ in the body of Christ. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? We've talked about it a couple of times. It's a great parable as it relates to salvation and fellowship. We recognize in the parable that the son never ceased to be a son. Remember, while he was sitting on the pigsty, he was hungry, he was destitute, and he came to himself. And he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me a hired servant. So his theology got all messed up when he was out of fellowship. Our theology gets messed up when we're out of fellowship. The things of God are spiritual, and uh, we have to be, uh, they are spiritually discerned. Uh, the soulish man uh, cannot understand the things of God. We have to be controlled by the spirit and in our human spirit. Well, the prodigal's out of fellowship, and out of fellowship, his doctrine's all fouled up. So he forgets he's once and for all a son, I'll go back and I'll ask to be made a hired servant. Well, look at 
the verse 20 in, in the story in Luke 15. He arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Oh, she got interrupted. He didn't get to say, make me a hired servant. But the father said to the servants, bring forth the best robe and put on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and bury it. For well, this Mike's son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. Wow. Once a son, always a son. We talked about this parable when we looked at the doctrine of adoption. That we have been adopted as sons of God. And we saw that the word adoption uh, in the Bible in the day in which it was written, does not mean what it means in our vocabulary today. When we talk about uh, adoption today, we talk about a process of law whereby we take a son that was born to other parents biologically, and we, through a process of law, make that our son legally. That's not what the word means in Scripture, because that's not the practice of the world at that time in relative to adoption. Adoption was started by the Romans. It was a process whereby they took their own son at age 14 and placed him as an adult member of the family. They adopted him at 14. The word adoption comes from the Greek word huyothesia, the placing of a son. They placed that son, now 14, as an adult member of the family and five basic privileges and rights that went to him immediately. He went on the family checking account. He was eligible for the inheritance. He could get married. He could go to war. He could join the military. And he had a voice and a role or position in the family as a result of that ceremony at age 14. The father would remove the, toe, the robe of adolescence that he wore as an adolescent to that point. Now he was an adult member. The father would put on him the toga virilis the robe of manhood, and he was an adult member of the family with those rights and privileges. Now remember, the prodigal has been away from home. He is the son of the father. Nothing will change that. Nothing can change that. He became the son by birth, just as we become sons of God by new birth, by faith in Jesus Christ. So he comes back to the father. He's hungry. He's destitute. The father calls for a robe. The father calls for a ring. The robe is the toga virilis. He is placed once again into the status of having these five rights and privileges. He can draw upon the family account. The ring is the signet ring that gives him access to the family account. He can draw up on the family account. His inheritance is validated. Now, remember, he took a portion of that and went to a far country and wasted it. But that was just a portion of his inheritance. When, we, uh, when, when the son is adopted, the son is given a portion of the inheritance right then. He doesn't get all of that until the father dies until the death occurs, and that's passed on. So uh, the father uh, restores to him access to the father to the family account and uh, affirms his inheritance, and uh, uh, the other rights and privileges are reinstated, and he kills the fatted calf. They have fellowship as a result of the confession 
on the part of the prodigal son. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost in his family. Well, he wasn't physically dead, but he was separated from the father, just as our separation from God by sin in our life breaks our fellowship. It doesn't keep us from being sons of God, but it does break our fellowship. So the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and thy side. I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, bring the robe, the best robe, put it on him, and a, a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and let's fellowship. Let's have a time of celebration. See, the son said, I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But before he could utter the false doctrine, make me one of your servants, the father interrupted him. Now, the, the placing of the son here is important as we see him put the robe upon him and the ring for his finger. The assets of his father were there all the time, but he was off in a foreign country. He couldn't access those benefits. When we're out of fellowship with God, we can't access the benefits that God has for us and that God has laid out for us in his word. We must be in fellowship to share in those benefits of our partnership with Christ as God. So they killed the fatted calf and they fellowship together. Uh, he had always been the son of the father. He had always had those things available to him, but he was in the wrong place, could not access them till he came back to his father's house. Now the washing of the feet uh, of uh, the individual uh, at, the, at the Last Supper, and Peter is the focus of that, is to show that we don't need salvation again, but we do need a cleansing. Now we're told in the prodigal son situation, they call for shoes for his feet. They washed his feet and put the shoes on him. Uh, restoration of fellowship has occurred. Well, the believer out of fellowship then cease, ceases to have access to that which is allotted, but by confession of sin, we're able to be restored to that and have that access. Now, an important question that we might raise here is how often do we need to wash our feet, and how do we get our feet washed? Well, I've already identified it's the middle voice. There is a joint participation between the believer and Christ in getting our feet clean. We participate in that. We confess, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, maybe we will, maybe we won't. If we do, he is faithful and just, forgives us our sin, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess, once again, is homologeo. It means to speak the same thing as or to name what we did. Thus, we are to acknowledge the specific thing that we have done. To whom are we to confess? Well, 1 Peter 2, 5 says that we are a holy priesthood. 1 Peter 2, 9 tells us that we are a royal priesthood. Revelation 1, 6 tells us that God has made us kings and priests. So we are believer priests. We don't go to some other mediator. We go directly to God through our high priest, Jesus Christ. This idea of going to a man who's been given the office of priest by some ecclesiastical order for the confession of sin cannot be found in Scripture anywhere. Uh, as a matter of fact, those who wrongfully claim that position call themselves father. <laughs> Matthew 23, 9 says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is 
in heaven. So our confession is made directly to God, the Father, in the name of and through the instrumentality of the provision made for us in Jesus Christ. And we are forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. In other words, we are restored to fellowship. Once again, we have access to the benefits of our being sons of God. Now, if we don't confess our sin, our feet remain dirty. And while we've certainly not lost our salvation, we've lost our fellowship. We lose our reward, but we don't lose our salvation. We lose that aspect of rewards. So we don't receive what was allotted in the way of rewards uh, uh, if we don't utilize the fellowship provision that God has made. Now, in our study of the doctrine of grace, we identified that God has provided grace for us in three areas. In salvation, we have God's righteousness at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E, God's righteousness at Christ's expense. In living the Christian life, we have G-R-A-C-E, that is God's resources at Christ's expense. And in eternity, we have grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's realm at Christ's expense. As a believer in fellowship, functioning under the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the assets of God's eternal kingdom available to us. He has placed us as sons of God. He has put us on his account. All of his promises, all of his provisions are available to us. But when we walk contrary to him and to his plan for our lives, then we take our journey into a far country, and those assets are not available to us. We simply need to return home as sons, to once again operate under those assets, to acknowledge that we've sinned against heaven, to have our allotted portion of benefits as a partner of the Lord Jesus Christ available to us. So the Christian is to walk in newness of life, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 4. The Christian is to walk according to the norms and standards of the Spirit, according to Romans 8, 4. To walk in honesty, according to Romans 13, 13. To walk by faith, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 7 to walk in good works, according to Ephesians 2.10, to walk in love, according to Ephesians 5.2, to walk in wisdom, according to Colossians 4.5, to walk in truth, according to 2 John verse 4, and to walk according to the commandments of the Lord, according to 2 John verse 6. Some of the admonitions that we have in Scripture about where we're to walk and how we are to walk. Now, when we walk where we should not walk, we get our feet dirty and our fellowship with God is broken. But through the confession of our sin, we wash our spiritual feet. And my question is, how clean are your feet tonight? Well, 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How often should we wash our feet spiritually? Well, anytime there's sin in our life, it is to be confessed. And so uh, the frequency of our need to wash our feet is related directly to the frequency of sin in our life when we allow the old sin nature to seduce us into uh, walking contrary to the word of God, to the will of God, to the design of God for our life. Had a, um, a chairman of deacons in the church where I pastored down in Huntington Beach, who after I had been there a while said to me one day, he said, I finally got a handle on this first John 1-9 thing. 
And I said, oh, uh, explain that to me. And he said, well, every Friday evening, I take a little time alone by myself with God, and I review the past week. And uh, every sin that I've committed that I'm aware of, I name to God. And I confess that and pray to God with that. And uh, what do you think of that? And I said, well, I think that's too bad. <laughs> that wasn't the answer he expected. He said, what do you mean it's too bad? I said, well, if your life is like mine, and like most others that I know, that means you are only in fellowship maybe 15 minutes or an hour or so the whole week. If you wait to Friday to take care of all those things, you're out of fellowship all week and don't have access to those assets that God provides for us because you're out of fellowship. No, we need to confess our sin when we have sinned and move on. Now, of course, there's another side to this picture, and that is uh, that we need to get the handle on the old sin nature so we're not confessing it so much we're, because we're not sinning so much because we've learned to avoid the temptation. So we'll pick up here next time and uh, talk about that concept some uh, as we uh, kind of draw all this study together. We've had now over, well, I think this is the 13th lesson that we've, we've shared together in, uh, and to, to look at the more positive side of it, uh, walking the way he would have us walk as we briefly summarize uh, in our closing statement. So we, um, we'll move to the open forum and, and uh, address your questions as you have them. If you have them this evening, uh, I'll be here to respond. Doctor? Good evening. Hi. Um, you mentioned uh, eternal kingdom. In, Jude, yeah. in, in Luke 17, 21, what did Jesus mean when he said the kingdom of God is within us? Say again. In Luke 17, 21, uh -huh. what did Jesus mean when he said the kingdom of God is, with, is within us? Well, because the kingdom of God is actually established we are, we are citizens of that kingdom, and our eternalness and relationship with him is established at the moment of salvation. As a result of our faith in him, we become citizens of the kingdom of God. The kingdom right now is within us. It's going to be a time when he establishes a millennial kingdom upon the earth for a thousand years, but the eternal kingdom then is yet beyond that. But that kingdom has already begun in us as believers. And so that's the reference that I see him making him, he's making there. So the, you're saying that the kingdom of God is, is within us. The, the yeah. eternal kingdom is in heaven or I mean I'm not understanding. The the identity of that kingdom, we're part of we're sure not all of the kingdom, but we're part of that kingdom. Okay. Is within us. The Godhead <laughs> is dwelling us. The Bible teaches us that we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit that the Father and the, and, and the Son dwell in us, uh, that they three are one and we are one with them. So we are part of that very kingdom, e even as it relates to our relationship with God and association with him. But the kingdom's principles and those things are being, uh, are taught to us in his word and we are instructed to adopt them and walk them. So uh, it's, the, the king we're not having to wait till the future time for the kingdom it has it, it is within us as he says uh, in its origin in the spiritual sense at this point so does that mean that there's two kingdoms or am I, am I misinterpreting no only one kingdom we 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 are part of that kingdom it has begun it is in us but the manifestation of it 
and the various aspects of it uh, are going to change so that this earth is going to be destroyed and a new heaven and a new earth are going to come into existence. But the kingdom is a kingdom of individuals with, with God, relationship with God. Where we live out that, that kingdom is, is going to change, but the kingdom has already begun in us according to Christ's message. Okay. Um, one more question. Do you understand that? Huh? Do you understand? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Part. Um, in, in Luke 6, 29 to 30, uh, does Jesus teach that we should turn the other cheek in every circumstances of the course of our daily life? Well, not if you go to where he told him as he was about to depart. I'm about to depart now. And before I told you that you were to not take any script or purse or anything with you when you went out to minister, I'm leaving. I'm telling you now, if you don't have a sword, sell your coat and buy one. So there's a harmony there. As a matter of fact, if you follow up on that, Peter tried to use his sword that night. Or did use his sword and the Lord rebuked him. There's a time and a place for it. So I think we have to harmonize scripture as far as um, how that is played out. Um, the turn the other cheek is the first step of that. But why would he tell them to buy a sword if they didn't have one? Uh, if he did not expect them to defend themselves and, and to take that route but not to live by the sword. <coughs> so, so there has to be a balance in that whole concept. I, um, a number of years ago, uh, one of the youth pastors in the county, uh, he and his wife uh, were surfing down on the beach in Ventura. And um, the, uh, the surfers seem to come, become very territorial, thinking that a beach belongs to them. And they were surfing there, and a group came up, and one of the guys told them, this is our beach, get off. It was a public beach, but he said, get off the beach. It's our beach. And, um, and the youth pastor responded, well, it's a public beach, and we are here and surfing. And, and he tried to avoid him. Uh, the guy got more belligerent and then uh, hit uh, the youth pastor's wife. Mm. Well, when he did, the youth pastor then unloaded him. Well, the deputy district attorney picked up on it because this guy is a youth pastor. Right. When he had an obligation to turn the other cheek. Mm. And so he prosecuted. He brought charges of assault and battery against the youth pastor. Well, they asked me if I would be a character witness. And I had only known the couple for about three months uh, as being students there at the school. And I said, well, I would, I would be glad to, to give testimony, but there's not a great deal that I could be supportive of you because I know very little about your character and background. But I'd be willing if you want me to go to make what contribution I could. So they decided not to call me and it ended in a hung jury. Mm. Well, the deputy DA was not satisfied with that. He wanted to make an example out of this youth pastor. So he re-prosecuted it. Well, it drug on to about a year. I had known them over a year when it went back to court. So they asked me if I would be willing to be a character witness, and I said I would. So I went as a witness. Uh, they didn't allow me to go in the courtroom uh, during the proceedings, except when I went to give my testimony uh, and uh, as a character witness. Well, the deputy DA said, uh, well, pastor, he said, uh, haven't you talked your young man here, the Bible says to turn the other cheek. And um, I acknowledged that he was not my youth pastor, that I knew him as a student, as being president of the college and being a professor in the classes, some of the classes that he, that he was 
enrolled in. And uh, I said, well, yes, we've, we've certainly identified that, that there is a principle to turn the other cheek, but I've also taught him that he is responsible for the protection of his wife. Mm -hmm. And his wife was struck, according to my understanding. Now I say you understand, I only have one side of the story, but it's my understanding that his wife was struck by this man and uh, that he was defending his wife. I said, uh, he said, have you seen the pictures of what he did to this man physically? And I said, no, sir. So he said, could the witness be shown the picture? So I thumbed through the pictures. And he said, what do you think? And I said, well, remember, I've only heard one side of the story. But if this man did what he's reported to have done, then I would say that uh, this uh, man that is being charged is being charged wrong, wrongly. And I would say that the guy got off easy. And he looked at me and he said, if I were attacking your wife, would you shoot me in the face with a gun? And I said, yes, sir. If you were attacking my wife, I would shoot you in the face with a gun. I, he said, and her life was in danger. I said, I would shoot you in the face with a gun. He said, what happened to, uh, you, you believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth instead of turning the other cheek. And I said, maybe you missed something the same God that wrote the Old Testament wrote the New Testament. And I said, we need to recognize that when Jesus was about to leave this earth, he said, before I told you, and he let me lay the whole thing out before the jury and everybody else, that Jesus had said, I told you not to take purse, not to take script, not to take any coat, to depend upon those, but now I'm leaving. And I say, if you don't have a sword, sell your coat and my wife. He said, I have no further use for this witness. <laughs> but uh, the jury acquitted him because there, there has to be a balance. If we live by the sword, we'll perish by the sword, the scripture says. But there is a place for the sword if we find the scripture. So there is a place to turn the other cheek. But there is also a harmony of balancing that out with our defending uh, and representation. Okay? Okay, so it's two different. It's one for defense, defense, and then the other one strictly for an altercation, sounds like. Well, yeah, but I would think we need to avoid having to use the sword and to turn the other cheek mm -hmm. whenever we can. But we only have two cheeks. That's it. And well, four. So, I was just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, I think we have to harmonize scripture to yeah. understand. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you. Good night. Good question. Thank you. Make sure I see a hand back there. Good evening. I do, Pastor. I have a question. Um, the two differences between uh, uh, Catholics and Christians, and how can what's what's uh, how do you say the, the two similar? How do, I'm trying to remember the question he asked. Um, how do they relate to each other? Well, I I hear I've even had Catholics say to me, "No, I'm not a Christian. I'm a Catholic." That's kind of a new philosophy because Catholicism has its roots in Christianity. Um, they are Christian. If, as we identify religious uh, connection, uh, Catholics are Christian. Uh, not all Catholics have become Christian individuals, but they, they embrace Christ as the savior, uh, so th their doctrine is filled full of ritual and a lot of, of other doctrine, uh, relative to the doctrine of Mary and to other aspects uh, that uh, some rebelled against and, and came out of and the Protestant movement of the Reformation uh, was established. 
Uh, there were other groups that were meeting that were never became part of the Roman Catholic Church uh, that were meeting and they were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church uh, in those first years of, of, Rome, of Roman Catholicism, which was 312 AD is when Constantine, the emperor of Rome, embraced Christianity and made it the religion of Rome. And then they tried to make Christians out of everyone by force. <laughs> and we have the Crusades and the things that went on there. <clears throat> the Catholicism misses it because they, they set up an ecclesiastical order in the church rather than identifying the individual relationship that the Christian is to have with God. And, and so that leads to all kinds of, of perverted doctrine and uh, false, false teaching. But I know Christ Christian or no Catholics that are Christian. I don't understand how they can stay in the ritual of the church and profess to be Christians or be Christian. Uh, but uh, they, they become Christians by calling upon the name of Jesus for salvation. Their, their ministry and lives are sidetracked into the ritual and the uh, religious practices of Catholicism itself. So I'm not sure what your question is. Um, the, the thing that makes the difference primarily is the Bible. We, as, as non-Catholic Christians, believe the Bible is our guide. And that we, as believers, are believer priests, as scriptures that I quoted a moment ago. And that we have the right to understand and relate to God personally. Catholicism doesn't accept that, but holds that you have to go through the church and through a priesthood uh, to do that. And, and that's not in harmony with the New Testament uh, scripture. It's a misunderstanding, first of all, about Peter. They believe that, that Jesus said, when Jesus said, uh, who do men say that I am? And the disciples say, well, some said John the Baptist, some said Elias, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, uh, Flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, but my Father that is in heaven. And I say that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, the word Peter is Petros, and it means rock. And so the Catholic interpretation is that he was saying to Peter, you are the rock, I will build my church on you, Peter. That's not what he was saying. He said, you're a small pebble, a petros. Upon this petra, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it is a complete distortion of what the scripture says about Peter. And then he said, I give to you the kingdom of the keys to the kingdom. <clears throat> they believe the Pope has the keys to the kingdom. That's plural. Mm -hmm. He didn't say to Peter, he said that to all the disciples. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then he said, whatsoever you will bind on earth. Well, the English text says, shall we shall be bound in heaven. The Greek text says, what shall, whatever you bind on earth will already have been bound in heaven. So we're the instruments that God uses. So they misunderstand that, misapply that, and believe in a papal authority where the Pope has authority over the interpretation of the word of God and the application of the word of God. So that's briefly the distinctions. But there are Catholics who have called upon the name of Jesus for salvation and they are saved. They're walking out of fellowship because they're, they have not embraced the Christian way of life. They're in the ritual of, of Roman Catholicism. And as a result, they miss much of the blessing that God has for them. 
Okay, I had a follow up on that. Um, do they so? Do they have the understanding of the Trinity, Catholics? Do they have to understand the Trinity? No, if they have an understanding of it. Oh, do they have an understanding? Yes, they do. So they also. But then, they, then they throw a fourth one in. <laughs> uh, they throw in Mary, and give her deity. And their their reasoning is this: if Jesus were God, and she was the mother of Jesus, then she's the mother of God. And they attribute to her deity, and they claim she never had other children, which the scripture clearly identifies. She had other sons and daughters after the birth of Jesus. So, uh, but, but they have elevated her to a place of deity. So they, while they believe in the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they, they put Mary in the mix there as well. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, the, the Bible warns against that. <laughs> uh, even in the book of Revelation, it's identified uh, as part of the mother goddess situation that you found in the Roman world uh, and, and earlier in the Greek world, uh, the, the goddess situation. Uh, the, it, it departs from the truth of Scripture and takes away from uh, Christ, uh, they, they actually elevate Mary above Jesus. Um, and so that's idea, uh, idol worship uh, and goddess worship. Okay, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. And do, uh, do Catholics go by the law more so or, they, or by grace? They, uh, they mix the two together. Uh, but they do not make a distinction, as clear a distinction between the Old Testament and New Testament uh, as mainstream Christianity does, uh, where they, they don't adhere to uh, the animal sacrifice, the sacrifice. The Levitical system is done, and they understand that, but they replace it with a with a um, ecclesiastical uh, order um, of bishops and uh, priests and bishops and cardinals and pope uh, with ascending authority uh, and, and institute a lot of ritual that very similar to what you had under the law. Okay. And yeah, close it up. I'll have some more in the okay. next time. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Good evening. Good evening. All right, I have a few questions on the five rights of adoption that you mentioned was um the family checking. They were able to get married, um, military inheritance, and what was the other one? Uh, they had were able to vote and had a role in the family. Okay. Access to the family account, inheritance, marriage, military, and a role, a vote and a role in the family structure. Okay. Um, and my next one, the, you, you mentioned this towards the end of the class and I just wanna make sure I got it right. It says, mm -hmm. um, well, I wrote down, now if we don't confess our sins, our feet remain dirty. Thus we stay out of fellowship. Hence, we have no access to our inheritance with God. Correct? No, yeah, to the benefits of the immediate advance uh, inheritance. It doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with the uh, inheritance, the the bigger portion of the inheritance. Remember, when they were adopted, they were given access to part of the inheritance at that time. Okay. Which is, and we identify that in Scripture, the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, the Scripture says. The word earnest means down payment or advance allotment. So when we're out of fellowship, the Holy Spirit doesn't have control of our life doesn't have anything to do with our eternal relationship 
but only with our temporal circumstance as we attempt to live out the Christian life here. Okay. When we're out of fellowship, the Holy Spirit no longer has control. The old nature does. All right, and then... Next was, okay, the, the luminos, that's the washed, a complete bath, right? What was the yeah. other one? What was the other one called? The, the, the complete bath is le luminos. Le luminos. Yeah. Okay. The other is nepto, N-E-P-T-O. And there are different forms of it in that text. Nepsis, nepstis, nepthine depending on whether it's an infinitive or whether it's a verb, what the tense is, changes the spelling. But the basic word is nipto, N-E-P-T-I-O. Which refers to confession, right? And that, that's to wash a portion. So that relates to confession. Okay. The word actually means to wash a portion of something. Okay. That's it, sir. Okay. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Good evening. Greetings. Um, I was wondering, like, a person that stays out of fellowship, say they're just been out of fellowship. I know that daily you have to, not just daily, but hourly, you have to kind of take an inventory and understand where you're at, where you're stepping at, or what your decisions that you made, right? Right. So you, it, it wouldn't be recommendable or proper to wait to the end of the finale of the day to confess, right? Because, I mean, what what would it benefit a person if, if, if you're saying you're Christian, you're Christ-like, you're supposed to be, but you're, you're, you're walking out of fellowship and... <laughs> And how, how are you earning any gifts or, or any treasures in heaven or building a relationship, period, when, when you're no in fellowship? Because now you're in fellowship with the world. You're doing what your, your, your flesh wants, and you're doing what your heart desires, the old sin and, nature desires. Right? And, and the benefit, yeah, but the real benefit of our confessing is to tell God what we did. So the more often we tell him, <laughs> the more we are prompted to deal with it before it becomes sin. That's the main purpose of it, as I see it, is to make us acutely aware of what sin is and what it does and acknowledge it and then move on. <laughs> it's, it, the, the, the focus shouldn't be just upon our being restored to fellowship by telling him what we did, but to become conscious of what we did so we stop doing what we did. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's where we're headed with this. So once an individual, uh, like say the individual, um, say like myself, so I know there's three that, that, that target on A for anyone, but for myself, hey, they're the main targets. And lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh -huh. But continuously, that's that's part of a, a continual battle daily, right? Because right. because you want, you want, you, until you die, you got to put up with whatever this carnalism is, this, this skin, this meat, right? But we can overcome it. See, through the Holy Spirit, right? Through the Holy Spirit and through the use of the Word of God, he said, the man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then God will not allow us to be tempted above what we're able, but will with the temptation make the way of escape. And the way of escape is the word of God. We saw that in James, and we're going to go back to that and, and identify. We, we can have victory. And... Uh, Paul cries out, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? But then he gives us the formula, I thank God is through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with the mind, I serve, or with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. But with the mind, I can serve the law of Christ. 
So we've got to get this mind renovated, yeah. reprogrammed. Exactly. So that we don't become susceptible to the temptation. Yeah, because that's that's where pretty much where my struggle is at is is mostly the my 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 during the day until certain events come up, you know, certain things, and then the, that's where the battle is mostly in my mind because I, I get it takes a picture. You know, the eyes the, the yeah. you know I, I can overcome the lust of the flesh, but the, the eyes, the lust of the eyes, all of a sudden it takes a liking, a desire. You say, oh, wow, that's good. You know, how beautiful. And then it goes on, but you got to catch yourself, right? And then right. confess it at the moment. So when you do confess, you, <coughs> a, a, an individual must tell him in detail you're wrong, where, where you did wrong and what started you. To you, how you began that, what what it began, and and you caught it. Say you caught it, but you, you and then you confess it. Say, hey, you know what, Lord, uh, forgive me. I was wrong for 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 I I stayed two minutes too long looking at that. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't rehearse the matter too much in my confession. Are you going to relive it? Okay. So we need need to be precise and identify what we did. We know the background of that. And then we need to take the steps to not be victimized by that, to not take the bait the next time. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. <laughs> oh, of course not. But, but it can happen where we can start having victory in it. But it has to be a conscious application, a conscious thought, when the temptation comes. So we're going to, to deal with that in, in our study next week as we, we shift gears a little bit and try to focus <clears throat> how to get out of the temptation, how to have victory in it so that we are not victimized. By Amen. It. All right. Thank you. And I look forward to next week then. All right. All right. God bless. Thank you. Going once? I think we're done. Going twice? Hold on, hold on. Another question. Hey, Pastor. Hi. On this, on this uh, passage of scripture, if you can uh, just elaborate on this passage of scripture. I've been wrestling with this passage of scripture for some time. So I just would like to, uh, for you to shed some light on it, which says, it says, uh, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no more sacrifice for sin is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging of fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the spirit of grace? Uh, 26, verse 26, as it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no more sacrifice for sins is left. Uh, could you uh, give me some, uh, some insight on that particular verse? Okay, in, in this context, he's talking about an unbeliever that has received the knowledge of the truth. He's received the gospel, but he stays outside of the scope of that gospel. Uh, the, the statement you read there keeps on sinning. If we go to 1 John 3, 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Mm -hmm. The reason he doesn't is because God's seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. He cannot sin. God's seed remains in him. When we harmonize that with Romans chapter uh, 4, 
we, we see that at the point of salvation, when we call upon the name of the Lord, our sins, past, present, and future are charged to Christ. So we no longer are identified as sinner. We, our sins never charged us. So as far as God's records are concerned, we no longer commit sin. But the individual that rejects the gospel, he continues sin. The, the sin that he commits is not charged to Christ, it's charged to him. And so that's the, that's the message that's there. He's talking about an individual who's been confronted with the gospel, but re rejects the gospel. Mm. And he actually uses the word reject the law when he uses the Old Testament uh, law as a symbol that he identifies the rejection there. So we're not talking about a believer that then commits sin, right. because positionally a believer no longer commits sin. See, that's why I needed the clarity if it was talking about an unbeliever or an apostate. Yeah, no, he's talking about an unbeliever because you can't harmonize the other view with 1 John 3, 9 on that. Right, okay. Well, thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Is that it? That's all we have, Pastor. All righty, we ready to close? Yes, sir. Then let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the time we've had together this evening. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit that is to be our teacher to teach us the application to our lives. We ask, Father, for conviction wherein we have fallen short that your spirit might convict us and rebuke us. And Father, we thank you for the confession that is available that we might be restored to fellowship. Help us to walk day by day in fellowship. And when temptation comes, give us the motivation to look for the exit. Look for the door that you've made out of that temptation and run through it. Strengthen us in our weakness and encourage us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I look forward to being with you next week, gentlemen.